Well, folks are joining us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for participating in yet another Washington Walks webinar Wednesday session. This week, we are going to be hearing from Josh Gibson, who has <clears throat> different DC identities. But today, his DC identity is going to be everything that relates to Adams Morgan, his longtime neighborhood. Um, also a place that provided him with employment. Uh, and I'll let him talk a little more about that. Josh, what is, what are all the connections you have had as a DC resident with the Adams Morgan neighborhood? Uh, it, it's not unfair uh, to say that I can thank Adams Morgan for pretty much everything in my life that matters. Uh, I took a job between years of grad school. I unexpectedly ended up spending a summer in uh, DC. I needed a job at the very last minute and I got a job with the Latino Economic Development Corporation in Adams Morgan. Uh, worked in the neighborhood for those couple months, loved it. Came back after I graduated from grad school, got a full-time job with that organization. Uh, had gone to my first ANC meeting, thought it was crazy and fascinating, <laughs> uh, ran for the ANC and served a few terms on the ANC. So that kind of got my local government interest going. Um, through the job at LEDC, I discovered the uh, Sitar Art Center, uh, mm -hmm. Children's Art Center uh, mm -hmm. for the community, became a board member there and met a staff member who I ended up dating. Um, left the board, ended up dating, um, and ended up marrying, and uh, still live in Adams Morgan with my wife and now daughter. Um, and uh, so again, Adams Morgan is uh, is everything to me. That's wonderful. So it sounds to me it's the only neighborhood in DC you've lived in. Yes. That's cool. I'm the same way. That's my dog hacking in the background. He does no, that. No, that's okay. He, helps. he does that. I have only ever lived in Southwest DC myself. So I'm similar to you in that I found a, found a perch and made it home. But I was thinking about when, I don't know if you feel like this, when I arrived in Washington, which is 1994, and those first few years, I was a grad student, but those first few years, I think when you move to a place, they make an imprint on you and either maybe it's going to be the imprint that makes you say, this is my place, or you realize, whoa, I have got to escape this. In my case, it was, this is my place. But I really, one of the big imprints was Adams Morgan, I was going to that neighborhood and immediately sensing that it was a very unique and special and vibrant part of Washington, D.C. that was really different than my Southwest D.C. neighborhood. And at the time in the 90s was really the place to go. It was really the place to go for eating out, for um, nightlife, and just considered the kind of such a cool neighborhood to live in if you were single or even if you were a family. Is that kind of what attracted you to it as well? Uh, well, I mean, I, I came to it having set foot in the neighborhood, I think maybe once or twice in my life, I came to it for that job. So I didn't really have any preconceived notions. Um, but I think what I've always loved about it is how it's, it's not quite right. I mean, it's like, it, it's a bunch of parts cobbled together. It has kind of two main streets with different characters, uh, two of them. It is a little off the beaten path, despite being central, and that it doesn't have a metro station. It's supposed to have metro stations. That's it. I know, but that's even not quite right, because when you get out, you're in Woodley Park. Yeah, no, no, no. But it, there was a, a supposed to be a spur on the very original ah. metro maps. There was supposed to be a red line spur, and I forget the three stops. I think were. Columbia and I know Mount Pleasant. Columbia and Connecticut, Columbia and Belmont, and Columbia and Ontario, maybe. 
Um, and in the end, they ended up doing a green line to kind of pick up the like Howard, Columbia Heights neck of the woods. But originally it was supposed to be a red line spur that came through Adams Morgan on the way to Columbia Heights and uh, Howard. But yeah, so it's a little, I mean, it's very central. It's walking distance from three different metro stations and has great bus service because the streetcar came here, uh, you know, originally. Um, anyone who knows Mama Aisha's uh, restaurant right mm -hmm. now that bus turnaround was a metro turnaround i mean a streetcar turnaround mm -hmm. yeah um, so well, yeah and to that end let me stop i'm going to stop sharing the welcome slide and i'm going to share um photos but we're going to ignore the first photo <laughs> this photo of um a school gives us a bit, gives us the origin story for the neighborhood's name. What are we looking at? Right, well, uh, I kind of my, uh, you know, for anyone who, who uh, read the introduction to today's talk, uh, they would see that Carolyn excerpted from my introduction to uh, mm -hmm. Adams Morgan Then and Now. Right. It was a book that I did with uh, Celestino Zapato a number of years ago. And I basically, I did the, uh, the most writing um, and he curated a lot of the photos. Um, and the introduction of that book is kind of my thoughts on the contradictions inherent in Adams Morgan as a place. So the name uh, Adams Morgan comes from the John Quincy Adams School, which was the all white school in the neighborhood and the Thomas P. Morgan School, which was the all African American school. So it's a diverse neighborhood, but it's named for two segregated schools but the way the neighborhood got its name was the at the time of uh, brown versus board of education and uh i think it was bowling versus sharp i think it was the dc yeah version of that yeah. Yeah. um the principals of the two schools came together to try to figure out how to go about desegregating the neighborhood um and there were a number of organizations that were named and one of the organizations was uh Again, the principals of the two schools, so it was the Adams-Morgan, uh, I forget the exact name of the organization. Um, so that's one of the contradictions that's inherent in the, uh, the neighborhood. The other one is, is that we are critical to our identity as a neighborhood, is that we're funky and offbeat and diverse and interesting, and as far as you get from suburban. But people don't realize that DC, you know, when DC, we think of Washington and DC as being two ways of saying the same uh, geography. But when DC uh, began as the nation's capital, it was more like a traditional state in the sense that there was the District of Columbia, which was the state boundaries, which at that point included Arlington and Alexandria, as well as current DC. Um, and there were counties, there was Washington County, um, that was the Washington side of the Potomac and there was Alexandria County on the other side. Then there were cities within the District of Columbia. So you had Georgetown, uh, DC, you had Alexandria, DC, and the city of Washington that went up to Florida Avenue, uh, which was called Boundary Street. Right. Um, from there, the only way you could get, if you think driving north up 16th Street, you get to the big hill next to uh, Meridian Hill, Malcolm X Park, that was quite a hill back in the day, if you yes. were on a horse. Um, and the uh, horse-drawn streetcar, uh, when it had those downtown, couldn't get up the hill. So the city ended at Florida, and the folks who lived north of there were generally wealthier landowners, farmers. Um, it wasn't until they had uh, motorized um, streetcars, electric streetcars, that this right. area became more accessible. And even then, we were a streetcar suburb. We were very much like, you know, you would think of, uh, you know, an inner suburb like the Thesda or, or Right, so right. Um, um, Let me get back to this image a second. This first image was the Morgan School. And for folks who are familiar with Adams Morgan today, more or less Marie H. Reed <clears throat> Education Campus. Their soccer fields, you said, are on the site of where that school was. But this is a school now that's right off of 18th Street, one of the main drags 
commercial thoroughfares in the neighborhood. But getting right. back to your streetcar, here's this wee little photo, but this is the um, streetcar line going over Rock Creek Park to get from one side of the park to the other. Right, and that's the, the um, where the Ellington Bridge is now. Right, so today you use this to get across the park into the neighborhood. And, uh, and the, the funny thing, again, going back to the, the fact that we were a suburb, despite defining ourselves as being the unsuburb uh, now, uh, I grew up in, in uh, Wheaton, Glenmont area out in Montgomery County, and there was this one neighborhood, uh, a couple neighborhoods over, and all the streets were named for Robin Hood characters, because they obviously had built the neighborhood <laughs> at once, and the developer was right. Robin Hood, so there was Loxley Lane, and Nottingham Forest, whatever. Like, I mean, that couldn't be more corny or cheesy or right, sort of right. terrible, except Adams Morgan and Columbia Heights were built that way. So, you know, we have Champlain and Ontario, which are Great Lakes. Yeah, right. Superior. Um, and Columbia Heights, there are universities. You know, Harvard is still there. Right. Um, Princeton, Kenyon, mm -hmm. something has changed since, but it's just funny that we were the suburb. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it just shows how, how things um, develop. And, and there's also been a, a economics, a bit of an economics roller coaster in the sense that originally it was obviously Native American land. Then, like I said, it was land primarily for the wealthy because they were the folks who lived out here in these grand farm manor homes. Uh, then the streetcar democratized it to a certain degree. Um, so it was more mixed income. Um, then after 1968, uh, it was lower income. Then uh, I have articles going back to 1979 saying uh, gentrification was coming, the unique, funky Adams Morgan we love was going away. Um, clearly the gentrification did happen. There were people displaced, but you know, we're going on now, do the math, 40 plus years of Adams Morgan uh, losing its identity and turning into Georgetown and all these things that were said would happen. And thankfully, you know, it's not the same neighborhood. A lot of people were displaced. Um, but thankfully, somehow the diversity and the, the funkiness have been able to remain. Endure, right. And it has a beautiful, <clears throat> diverse um, built environment, beautiful, um, large row houses when you compare um, row houses that you might find in um, neighborhoods south of Florida Avenue, particularly earlier pre-Civil War row houses. Um, but there are you know, homes here that you easily can raise a family in. I mean, you all are doing that. Here are beautiful row houses on Mintwood Place. I think this for, for previous shot also is Mintwood Place in the neighborhood. We are getting a little view here. Parking, right? You don't get parking necessarily with a row house. So you've got to park your car in the street if you have a car, right? Maybe you don't need a car if you live in the neighborhood. Yeah, I had a, the first year or two I lived in the neighborhood, I not only had a car, I had an SUV that pre-existed from when I lived in Maryland. And um, I would drive it a couple hours a month. Half of that was looking for parking. The next time I needed it, I'd have to remember where I'd put it. And I couldn't find a new place to put it, circle forever. And right. then thankfully, someone uh, re-rented it and totaled it when it was parked down the street. <laughs> so the, that was the end of that. <laughs> put the money and ran, you know, so that was, money for car sharing and uh, the diverse uh, ways to get around town that we have now. Right. Well, you know, just getting back to the <clears throat> street names, how about even Adams Morgan is one neighborhood you can go to as a Washingtonian or a visitor and you can escape the grid. If you're just fed up with north, south, east, west, grid of streets, go to Adams Morgan because it curves and it it squiggles and you can get kind of lost. And if you like that sort of um, 
streetscape, nothing better. Nothing yeah, better. it is definitely, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and the other thing about Adams Morgan, speaking to the sort of twisting streets is that, and a lot of folks get a little confused about this, is they say, I live in Adams Morgan, but I've also heard Calorama mentioned, I've heard mm. Lanier Heights mentioned, and the neighborhood is actually, there are four, just like there are four quadrants of DC, there are four quadrants of Adams Morgan. Uh, the North East quadrants where I live is Lanier Heights, uh, kind of the Safeway would be the, the okay. big yep. there. Yep. The northwest quadrant is Calorama, which is the historic district, which you know is sort of the schmancier uh, part. Right. Uh, then the southwest portion is Washington Heights. That's kind of the west side of 18th Street. Um, and then the fourth quadrant is Reed Cook, which is interesting in the sense that it is also named for two schools. Uh, the Marie H. Reed School, which is the school that we saw earlier that replaced the Morgan School, and H.D. Cook, which is the other elementary school on uh, 17th Street. So uh, I never in addition knew that. To, Thank you. I didn't. I never realized that. So it's like these yeah, little subcultures was in the larger neighborhood. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's so it's uh you know and and they're, they're each sub neighborhood even has a certain character to it and uh, just like we all have favorites and are a little. Uh, uh, you know, uh, patriotic loyalty to our neighborhood. People also have that to their their little sub neighborhood of Adams Morgan. Well, you've, so you've got these unique um, row houses, later nineteenth, early twentieth century row houses. But then, anyone who's driven up Sixteenth Street, especially, um, you can find these beautiful mansions, uh, large scale mansions built to impress that probably appeared in the 1880s and 1890s. This is one that has become the Meridian International Center, which if folks have not ever been there or seen it, it's more or less across 16th Street from um, Meridian Hill, Malcolm X Park. And so there's the, there was this scale of home. And then you, you all also have really iconic multifamily buildings like this one. This may be the most well-known one, the Ontario. Um, a beautiful place to live, really close to Rock Creek Park. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's interesting. Uh, there, there was um, Carolyn. Maybe you remember his name? Uh, no, Tony Pitch. I just remember his name. Uh, there was a British uh, gentleman and historian who used to offer uh, walking tours a couple decades ago. Yes, you're right. Yes. One yeah. element of that that I remember. Uh, was on the walk, he would show, I think it was Bernstein, I don't, it was either Woodward or Bernstein, I think it was Bernstein, showed his apartment before Watergate broke, and there he had a balcony where he would single, signal his sources and put a, a pot flower, a potted flower in a different part of the balcony, whether or not he wanted to meet with the source, and then after uh, Watergate, um, when he was rich and famous, he moved into this building, into the Ontario. Into Ontario. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of Anthony Pitch, who sadly, um, he passed away maybe now three years ago. Right. But again, so the heyday of him being a tour guide and publishing guidebooks about DC probably was in the 90s, early 2000s. And just to give an idea of the status in the appeal of Adams Morgan then, one thing that Tony published, he has little, his own little publishing company, was a fabulous map of Washington, D.C. that he distributed to all the hotels. And the hotels got a lot of maps given to them, but the Anthony Pitch map was the one they always wanted to give visitors. Just the, it was, the look and feel was good. It was easy to read. It had the metro stations imposed on it. But then on the back, he had a smaller map of Adams Morgan. And he had ads for all the restaurants in Adams Morgan, partly because he did a walking tour there, but also because he knew that this was the place that if you were a visitor to Washington, this, you wanted to go there. You had to check this out if you wanted to kind of say, I've really been to Washington, DC. No, it's definitely true. I think it was, a, yeah, I think it was probably a moneymaker for him. I think that actually, 
was. And you know what's cool is I was in a hotel not that long ago before COVID and um, his map is still around. I think maybe his kids are still doing the publishing company because that map, that map was, that was a good map. Well, this is a mural. Um, tell folks about this. And I just thought this was emblematic of um, who's lived in Adams Morgan. Yeah. Well, the different kind of iterations of the neighborhood. Adams Morgan has always been known for its murals. There are two or three iconic murals. Um, one, I know we're going to see in a bit, the Adams Morgan uh, mural. There's the Toulouse Lautrec mural on the old Cafe uh, Lautrec. Um, and, uh, and this one. And what's interesting about this one is, and I forget the exact age on this mural, but it's decades old. Um, and in the upper right hand corner of the mural, you can see that's basically gentrification happening. Those are the developers, uh, you know, like Monopoly uh, splitting up the houses and the buildings of the neighborhood. So that speaks to, again, gentrification. I'm not saying it hasn't been happening um, and there hasn't been displacement, but uh, this long-term fear that we would lose Adams Morgan, uh, thankfully has not um, come to pass. Um, what was it that drew uh, Latino immigrants or citizens to this neighborhood? My, the story I've heard, which I can't uh, prove or disprove, but which makes sense. And let me, I'm going to lose that specific question. So remind me in about five minutes when I finish this tirade. <laughs> um, back, I'm not tirade, but this stream of thought. Speaking of the manor houses going up and down um, 16th Street, a lot of people uh, will be familiar with, as you go north on 16th, opposite Meridian Hill, Malcolm X, there's this strange dark red <laughs> crenellated castle wall. Yes. Looks to uh, be a battlement. <laughs> right, and a lot of people don't realize that, believe it or not, not that long ago, 40, 50 years ago, there was a castle to go with the castle wall. Uh, and the castle was the residence of uh, Senator Henderson of, uh, of Missouri. And his more powerful, more uh, creative uh, wife, Mary Foote Henderson. And the, you know, there's the expression that uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, for Mary Foote Henderson, 16th Street was that hammer. She wanted her neighborhood to become, and by her neighborhood, I mean like everything within 100 feet of her house, like not even all of Adams Morgan, like just that stretch. <laughs> she wanted, she had every dream in the world um, for that neck of the woods. She uh, actually got Congress to briefly change the name of 16th Street to Avenue of the Presidents, and there were plans on every street corner to have giant a bust of a different, enormous bust of a different president as you went north up and down the street. Um, Meridian Hill, Malcolm X Park, she, when they were designing the Lincoln Memorial, she wanted the Lincoln Memorial to go there. When uh, she had a plan to put the White House, the, at some point, the decision that has really funny quotes that basically the White House being in the literal lowercase s swamp was malarial. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it was bad for the president to be down there and it'd be better for his health and his family's. Yeah. They were at an elevated spot, which is why a lot of people did move to Adams. Yeah. Park. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, the, that whole part of the city was advertised late 19th, early 20th century for healthful zephyrs that you could feel wafting across your face if you lived in one of the row houses or apartments. Yeah, but she really felt like she had a direct line and she may have done to the White House where she could just pitch these ideas and she seems to have had or believed she had a listening ear. And there are, I mean, she got a fair amount of stuff done. Um, and, and on the Lincoln Memorial and the White House, there are some fascinating, they actually did designs and the White House is like bigger than the Versailles. Um, and the, the Lincoln Memorial designs are like Egyptian pyramids. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's remarkable. Um, she wanted the vice president's Yep. residents to be up there when that was being discussed. Um, but to come back to your original question, I told you I was going to go kind of far afield. One of the things, and she was successful with this, uh, she wanted more embassies set up right. on 
left in its yeah. tree. Yeah. And, and some of them are still embassies, yep. you know, Cuban embassy, the Lithuanian embassy, um, the Polish embassy, uh, the Spanish embassy, uh, the formerly the French embassy was there, um, the Mexican Cultural Center. Yep. Um, so anyway, the theory I've heard about how Adams Morgan became a diverse uh, bilingual Spanish-speaking neighborhood was that the staff wanted to live close to work. And there were a lot of staffers, uh, domestic kitchen staff, and they wanted to live nearby. So they would live in the little smaller homes that surrounded these big palatial uh, embassies. Mm -hmm. And that they just stayed put. Uh, you know, even as the embassy, some of the embassies closed, um, they stayed put and that was how uh, that got started. Wow. Let's see what I got next. Ah, okay. Another population and a cuisine that traditionally was uh, connected to Adams Morgan. I mean, certainly when I lived here, moved here in 1984, you, if you wanted Ethiopian food, if you wanted to find out what is Ethiopian food, how do I eat that? I've never heard of it before. You went to Adams Morgan, and chances are you went to this restaurant, Meskram, which was there on this location for 30 years. Yeah, and it was kind of funny because it, not so much anymore, but back in the day, you know, the 80s and the 90s, there were a ton of cabs parked on 18th Street because most of the cab, uh, the uh, taxi drivers were either Ethiopian or Eritrean. Yeah. And uh, they would hang out there and go up, have coffee, uh, have lunch. Um, so it was a real uh, dense area. And I know I've read articles about how Adams Morgan came to be. Uh, it was not as straightforward as the sort of Latino uh, um, residents settling in the neighborhood. Um, and to this day, it's, it's definitely not quite what it once was, but uh, fortunately when uh, Zanabak um, moved from next to the, um, the Ellington uh, Theater, it, uh, not the Ellington Theater, the, um, not the Lincoln. The um, Howard. Howard, thank you. Uh, there's the statue Duke Ellington in front, which is what I was thinking right. of. When they had to move, they moved up to Adams Morgan. So right as we were on the brink of losing our sort of Ethiopian foothold, they came and, and they're recognized as one of the best. So um, we're lucky that we got to keep that um, yeah. culture in the neighborhood. Um, oh, sorry, this is so small, it irritates me. Um, but nightlife, for better or for worse, some, you know, depends how, how, if you live in the neighborhood where nightlife or even day life is a factor, and maybe there's an enclave in your neighborhood that attracts all that kind of activity, you, I guess you can consider that the best thing to happen, or you can, you know, find it an irritation. But it's been a part of 18th Street, Columbia Road in Adams Morgan for decades, for decades. Yeah, it's, it was, when I was on the ANC, uh, it was definitely part of that uh, nightlife phase. Uh, and the struggle was that for a while, Adams Morgan got this really negative uh, stereotype of being a bunch of uh, bars for frat, frat boys from the suburbs coming in to do jello shots. Um, and a little later, a jumbo slice pizza. And what folks forgot is that Adams Morgan has always been a great retail destination, neighborhood oriented retail, and it has always had great restaurants and also had nightlife. Uh, but there was sort of that phase that was unfortunate where people were like, oh, Adams Morgan, it's just for, you know, dollar Bud Lights. Yeah. Um, and it was never true. I mean, there were still amazing restaurants yeah. and shops, but now, I feel like we've come out the other end of that. And um, again, folks are associating us with Michelin, I mean, great affordable restaurants, but also Michelin starred restaurants. And, and, yep. uh, and well, one in fact, Tail Up Goat has gotten lots of plaudits since it opened in the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is I, I live on Lanier Place 
And when I moved in to our apartment in 2005, out our front window in the distance, well, out our front window in the foreground was a gas station. There was the gas station right at, on Adams Mill Road, right by 18th and Columbia. Um, in the distance, you could see the very tippy top of the Capitol, if you looked in just the right spot. And out another set of windows, you could look out and see the cathedral. And as a sign of the uh, development that's happening, the gas station got redeveloped into a mixed use building, which is where Tale of Goat is. Uh, a building was built right next door to us that blocked our cathedral view. Uh, yeah. So and then behind us, another building got built. And it's, it was sort of an interesting moment as a lover of cities and neighborhoods that if we're going to beat sprawl, we need increased density. Yep. If you need increased density, it's got to go somewhere. Yep. And we certainly did not want to be uh, NIMBYs. So we you know, made sure everything was being done legitimately and you know, within the law, but we supported the development that happened around us. Um, yeah, but that's... In, in, in yep. going through our... Um, we have the minutes where we live in a co-op and we have the minutes of the co-op going all the way back to when it was founded a uh, hundred years ago. And there was a note uh, in, I think it was the thirties where they set aside like 20 bucks for a legal fee to fight the gas station going in. You know, it wasn't always a gas station. So right. they the building fought unsuccessfully to block the gas station and then decades and decades later the gas station went away and like if you had told me when I moved in I could like literally throw an acorn out my bedroom window and hit a Michelin starred restaurant I know uh, right I would right. not have believed it but uh, right right but yeah, that's kind of fascinating to watch how neighborhoods change. yes it is and I always tell folks when I lead walking tours that um the only constant about living in a city is change and it's going to break your heart sometimes and if you can't stand to have your heart broken now and again or just have to adjust um city life may not be for you because it as soon as you sort of say hey yeah this is how i like it yeah 1998 dc ah yeah <laughs> it's just not gonna last I have great, I think because when I moved here, I have great nostalgia for late 90s Washington, D.C. Um, there's not a whole lot of it left. Um, but, you know, I'll probably be saying that about 2008 Washington, D.C. I actually probably already do. Anyway, here's the, one of the other murals that you mentioned, the one on the side of Madam's organ. Um, right. Then you. And, you know, to, to your point, you can't put a pin in a moment in a neighborhood. Uh, and I think folks, you know, nostalgia can, can kind of close your eyes to some things. I mean, I, up until recently, still had people uh, sad to say that the uh, Ben Franklin Five and Dime. Uh, oh, wow. Which is clearly a, a, a different era. Um, you know, and there were open, you know, Vernon Street, which is one of our most attractive uh, streets architecturally. Uh, apparently was a huge open air drug market. So they remember the folk, they remember the restaurants that were open during the time and the stores that were open and they've forgotten the yeah. open air drug markets. And yeah. now the open air drug markets are gone, those businesses are gone, but we have new problems, you know, again, of displacement. Yeah. Uh, so, but the funny story about Trist is when I, um, had my internship here the first time I ever uh, worked in Adams Morgan, I went door to door to all the business owners in Adams Morgan and Mount Pleasant to do a basic sort of business census. And um, then I continued that work when I got my job at the same nonprofit. And I, when I first started, Trist was, uh, half of it was an electronics store. There was a wall down the middle. Half of it was sort of a no-name electronics store, and half of it was an up-against-the-wall clothing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, and then the second time I went through to do this business survey a year later, both of those businesses were closed. And I went in the door, and I'm trying to get someone to do my survey, and it's this new business that hasn't opened, and there's this young guy up a ladder, uh, and 
he came down and, and I said, so what's the story? And it was the uh, Constantine Stavropoulos, who now is the owner of Trist and Diner and Open City and Makuta. Yeah. And I was like this scruffy second year intern. He was just opening his first business. And then fast forward a decade or so after that, we uh, started the Adams Morgan Business Improvement District. And so I was the executive director and he was the chair of the board. But it's just so funny, me with my little clipboard and him up a ladder, you know, installing a lamp or something, uh, our sort of scruffy neighborhood beginnings. Right. But you both had a big investment in the neighborhood. I mean, that you yeah. both ended up working with the bid. Yeah. But, I mean, Trist, like, it's hard to imagine the neighborhood without Trist now that it's been around for, you know, 20 something years. Exactly. But yeah, yeah, it's, there was a time before that when it was not that interesting, but that cuts both ways. There are times where you're a lover of the thing that was there. Yep. And then it goes away and something terrible comes in. It's and you're true, right. Sometimes your heart really gets broken and you just have to sort of live with that wound <laughs> afterwards because you're right, because the thing that comes next is not yeah. quite the same. I, I'm not a car owner. So when the gas station went away, I did not miss that. You know, and I prefer having a coffee shop and a restaurant there, but there are other things that went away that, like you said, breaks your heart. Yep. Yep. Well, here's something that shows this is not going to go away. Because um, for one reason, this is a national park, or at least it's overseen by the National Park Service. Meridian Hill, Malcolm X Park. So I, we, I said this, but I'll repeat it. This is across 16th Street from where Mary Foote Henderson's castle home slash mansion once stood. And this is a place of, um, this is probably the largest park in the neighborhood, right? Well, unless you count Rock Creek Park, but um, kind of a purpose-built park. Yeah, and I, I forgot to close out my Mary Foot Henderson chapter, but the uh, Meridian House, that big, beautiful mansion that we saw, uh, the um, owners of the Washington Post owned I forget if it was that one or two mansions right next to each other. They owned one of the two mansions. And after the Hendersons were long gone and the castle was abandoned, um, basically uh, folks were just um, squatting in the old castle and they would have these loud parties. And I don't think it was the, I guess maybe it was the sixties by then raves. And, um, and the uh, owners of the post, um, the family couldn't tolerate the noise. So they bought the castle and had it demolished. So that is who we have to blame for uh, the, uh, the loss of the castle. So if you see the yeah. photo, it's this amazing. Oh yeah. Thing. I mean, it would have been, yeah, if it was such a touchstone building for a moment a chapter in DC history. Yeah, I mean, important probably to preserve it. And when you think about it, so you continued south down 16th Street all the way to um, where the White House is. And I'm just thinking of another residential building that was really important in a way to DC history. And that was the Hay Adams House, now the site of the Hay Adams uh, Hotel. But what's kind of neat is, um, the same architect who designed the Hay Adams House, Henry Hobson Richardson, ends up designing a quite beautiful building on 16th Street that I can't remember if it became an embassy or um, was a single family home, but it's still, it was a single family home originally, but it's still at least, it still at least stands. Um, yeah, I mean, mo most of the architect uh, architecture on 16th Street did stick around. You know, it changed purposes. It was an embassy. It stopped being an embassy. Uh, but yeah, the, just the glaring uh, losses of the castle, and particularly because it was replaced by Beekman Place, right. which was a horrible suburban, gated 70s era, aluminum siding looking. Yeah, not, not, you yeah, can't yeah. quite measure up. I mean, yeah, we could go, yeah, there's, DuPont Circle, we could talk about. <laughs> Same thing happening there. All Souls Unitarian Church. Yeah, it's um, right at the, the corner there of Columbia and 16th and Harvard are these three steeples. 
Um, and the, you know, one is the Mormon church that became the uh, Sun Young Moon uh, church, Uni Universalists. I forget unification, the unification. unification. I knew it was with the U. Um, there are those three churches. And if you're ever, it's a great way if you're like downtown on a roof deck or something and you're trying to find Adams Morgan, if you find those three steeples or like if you see an old uh, postcard of DC with a sort of a view from a blimp or a plane and you're trying to figure out and orient yourself, those three steeples, because uh, they're, as far as I know, I can't think of three other churches that tall and that close together, even on 16th Street. No, so right. it's a great landmark um, right. to look at those three churches. And this is definitely still, this is still a thriving congregation and a, the mother church, I would say, for the Unitarian community in the, um, certainly in the District of Columbia, but maybe in the DC metro area as well. Yeah, and I haven't listened to it, but the, um, the third church on that corner, um, which again, I'm blanking on the name of, um, but that is the one where the pastor uh, was part of the civil rights movement and was killed. And there's actually a very popular podcast investigating the crime um, that I've been meaning to, uh, to listen to. So this is an image of a site that I bet a lot of folks um, listening today may not be familiar with. And this is a really dramatic moment in DC history. This is the Knickerbocker Theater, which was a movie theater, correct? Yep. Yeah, th this is one of my favorite, and we've been talking about it a bit, one of my favorite parts of Adams Morgan history are the layers of history, or the, you know, what was there, what replaced it. And so for folks who know uh, Adams Morgan, this is the location where the SunTrust uh, Bank is at the southwest corner of, of 18th and Columbia. Uh, and it was the grandest movie theater in Washington, D.C. Um, you can see from the marquee and everything. Uh, just the height of luxury with lounges for men, lounges for women, smoking rooms, uh, elaborate snack bars and uh, food lounges and, uh, and everything. Um, and then in uh, 1922, uh, DC had the greatest snowfall that's been recorded before or since. And um, People were in the middle of uh, watching a movie that was apparently called Get Rich Quick Wallingford. Um, they weren't great with naming movies back then. Um, and uh, people were in the movie theater and they heard cracks from the ceiling above them and the roof uh, collapsed and um, it killed almost a hundred people. And um, the coverage of it, you, you can read online, the Washington Post, it was, a, I think, a theater writer who happened to be the person who was there covering the story. And it's just the breathless uh, coverage of uh, people who were cut in half by collapsing girders and parents outside wondering what happened to their kids. It just the terrible heart-rending stories um and it was also uh you know I, I don't know if they had like first second and third class seats back then but it was a wide range of people that were caught in it i mean there were ambassadors there were members of congress uh, i think the postmaster uh was in there and then also just like neighborhood kids and people on dates and um so, uh, and the Congress held hearings and the architect and the developer both ended up committing suicide because they oh, wow. standard construction. Um, it, just a terrible, terrible tragedy. Um, and then amazingly, speaking of the layers of history, um, they uh, immediately rebuilt the theater um, to uh, the new theater, they at least changed the name. Uh, to the Ambassador Theater, um, but then 
um, as the sort of character of the neighborhood changed, they weren't able to, um, it wasn't working as a movie theater. So in the 60s, it ended up becoming sort of a psychedelic uh, hangout, uh, for lack of a better uh, word. And um, Jimi Hendrix played uh, the ambassador. It's one of only, I forget the number, three or four places where he ever lit his guitar on fire. Um, and uh, the Grateful Dead was supposed to play there, but didn't. They actually, there's a poster you can uh, see online that talks about when they're supposed to play, but the last second the uh, concert got canceled. Wow. Someone then, who's listening just shared that when they rebuilt the Heyrich family, so Christian Heyrich Brewery, and today the Heyrich House, Heyrich Mansion, off of DuPont Circle, the family underwrote the cost to replace the stained glass um, kind of conservatory roof. Conservatory is not the right word, but the glass roof of the new theater. Hmm. That's, that's the first I've heard of that. I'd like to see some documentation on that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not saying it's not true, just would love to see it. Um, so, um, and then after, again, speaking of the layers of history, after the ambassador was demolished, there was an effort to put a BP gas station there and the community came together and fought uh, this, you know, essential central neighborhood space being turned into a gas station. And there was graffiti on the side of the uh, Julia, what's now Julia's Empanadas, um, bilingual community graffiti in English and Spanish saying BP out of our neighborhood. And they ended up doing, uh, they would have called it like a community charrette process, but the community was very vocal about what they wanted. And in the end, uh, the bank went in, but the bank, uh, from community uh, um, persuasion, uh, agreed to do a certain amount of lending in the neighborhood, lending mm. to small businesses. Uh, and also there's some question about the exact details of this, but also the farmer's market uh, on the plaza yep. uh, started around that time. And that, that is, there, there's an effort now, again, speaking of layers of history, to redevelop that whole corner Right. Uh, and for most of the plaza to go away. Right. But what's interesting is most people don't realize that entire plaza is and has always been private property. Uh, there's the legal argument that when you allow public use of private property over a number of decades, it becomes in effect public property and you're not allowed to build on it. The courts are still trying to work that out. But if a new building were to come in there, um, it would be much closer to the footprint of the Knickerbocker or the Ambassador Theater than of the current, you know, right. if you look at the, the current building there, there's the old bank drive through behind it. Mm -hmm. right. space. It looks like an alley, but it's private space. And then the plaza in front of the bank is private space. And if a new building went in, it would take up most take of that. Because that, yeah. that, that part, that feels really like a neighborhood crossroads and by I mean that it functions a little bit like the um, DuPont Circle Fountain Park. People cross it all the time, people pause, people are selling things, there's the farm market. It's just where you sort of can take the pulse of your neighborhood walking through there. But, but again, it's the, it's the question of not being able to put a pin in history. You yes. Know, today, we cannot, there's no way we can build on that plaza. It's a plaza, we love it, that's true. But you're picking a point in history that you liked, right. not realizing that for a much, much, much longer time, it wasn't a plaza. And the building went right to the corner, right to the corner. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, so it, it's just, it's interesting that folks use history sometimes as a weapon, but it's their history. And Adams Morgan, when it was Native American before, you know, and then it was rich, it was poor, it was rich, it was poor. Like, which of those moments do you want to return to and which is the authentic Adams Morgan? Uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. This site is kind of an example of just that. We're looking at now Harris Teeter and residential buildings. We can just see the rise of residential behind it, but what was this? 
this is one of my uh, favorites, um, again, for a layers of history reason. Uh, it was called the Citadel. Uh, it was built originally, it was designed uh, to be an armory, um, but the war ended, so they didn't really need it as an armory. Uh, and it has had every possible life since then. Um, the Washington Opera, for a year or two, that was their rehearsal space. So opera rang uh, through those walls. Uh, it was a go-go dance destination. Uh, it was a roller rink. So a lot of African-American folks remember uh, roller derby. I mean, it wasn't just a roller rink, like community used. It was also mm -hmm. used for roller derby. Uh, so a ton of people remember it from that era. Uh, it was a movie studio. So parts of Peggy Sue Got Married and Pelican Brief were filmed there. Um, if people remember from the 92 presidential election, there was an MTV uh, youth voter forum mm -hmm. and someone asked Bill Clinton uh, if he wore boxers or briefs and he famously kind of hedged. That was filmed in this building. Um, so, oh, and it was, I left two things. I mean, this is what's so crazy about it. Like, I left these out. Uh, it was WWF, World Wrestling Federation, kind of mm -hmm. before that became an arena thing when it was in smaller venues. They did that there, and it was really, from reading some of the review, some of the uh, accounts from that time, it was really iffy. <laughs> Uh, Sugar Ray yeah. Leonard boxed there because it was also a boxing arena. So you walk by it and it, it's, you know, kind of interesting uh, architecture. It's a, you know, it's a Harris Teeter now, uh, but you just think Bill Clinton's been in there and Sugar Ray yeah. Leonard has been in there and Julia Roberts has been in there. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that. Right. And so this today is what kind of became the go-to development approach in the uh, late 90s and 2000s, which is mixed use. So we've got retail here, we've got residential here as well in a building that already existed. And the interesting thing is it was not the, the I was on the AMC when that project went through and the developers were actually very uh, open to community input. And what we wanted more than anything was office space because uh, Adams Morgan's Achilles heel has always been a lack of daytime foot traffic. Um, back to the night conversation um, and to when I was uh, interning for the community development nonprofit, we did pedestrian foot counts different times of the day. And you would see that there'd be a steady stream of a hundred people an hour on most of the streets. And then on a weekend night, there'd be a thousand people an hour. So anyone with money would see that and would open a bar or a restaurant mm -hmm, oriented. Mm -hmm. um, because since we don't have many offices, we don't have a metro station and we don't have one single go-to tourist destination, the neighborhood kind of emptied out during the day. And what we were saying to the developer of that, that Harris Teeter building was if you put offices above it, and that generated a couple hundred people walking around during the day, eating lunch, eating breakfast. That could make a big difference. Um, he tried to lease it for two, three, four, five years for office space. So, you know, designers, IT firms, right. no one bit. And eventually he gave uh, up and it ended up being residential. Residential. Wow. I um, wonder if, he, if it, in, in this era, I wonder if it could have worked as a co-working space. It could, it possibly could have. One of the challenges is because it was built as an armory, it has like three foot tall, three foot thick concrete walls. And the residential uh, that they put in there, it's like these weird units with 20 foot ceilings and no yeah. windows. Yeah, if folks want to, yeah, but, Google, Google the Citadel apartment in DC and you can see uh, it's a very unique uh, residential life you have in particular units in the building. Well, so desire for foot traffic, desire for tourist destination, a place for tourists. Does this, does this site we're looking at now help with that? This is I, I testified uh, in favor of this project moving forward. Um, this is uh, the former Church of Christ Scientists building uh, just a block off 18th and Columbia. 
And kind of like the Citadel, kind of like the Harris Teeter building, it was a bit of a white elephant. It was a bit of a, what would we do with this building? Uh, the church saw a declining um, uh, um, number of uh, parishioners uh, and it was incredibly expensive to maintain and to heat. Uh, just to the right, you can't quite see it, there's a Christian science reading room and the size of the church shrunk so much that they would meet in the reading room. In the reading room, yeah. 20 or 30 of them. Um, and there was a lot of nervousness about this giant building. We don't want it empty, but what is going to go there? Um, there was talk of residential, uh, um, but in the end, what went in was a hotel with a couple of restaurants inside um, and uh, a good community uh, gathering space. Um, the, the, and to bring kind of the story full circle, the, when the Knickerbocker uh, theater roof collapsed, the basement of this church was uh, the morgue. Oh, wow. The hotel people don't like when I tell that part of the story because it's definitely haunted. Um, <laughs> But hey, this has put the neighborhood on the map. I mean, the neighborhood's been on the map, but this has really infused some, um, some hipster hot buzz. The Line Hotel, the restaurants in it by a, a local, um, really successful restaurateur, Eric Bruner Yang. This has gotta be bringing people, locals well, and visitors to the neighborhood. When I, when I supported the project, uh, that was the reason why, was I did see it as what would finally draw tourists and out-of-towners and would build uh, some daytime foot traffic. Um, it has to have helped. I don't, can't say that I've seen a day and night change, um, but it, it is definitely a, a landmark in the neighborhood. They mm -hmm. um, would be remiss if I didn't mention they definitely are, uh, developers are embroiled in some controversy about whether or not they met the requirements. Right. To open yeah. them. And if they had certain hiring requirements uh, right. that is uh, strongly disputed that they met uh, the requirements for opening it. Um, and I, uh, my, my take has generally been, I try to um, hold the developers accountable for that, but not the hotel. I, I don't, again, because we had so much trouble with putting the hotel in, I'd hate to see that space empty. Yeah, oh, right, yeah, that'd be awful. But clearly that uh, uh, developers need to be held accountable if they committed to hire a certain number of people for construction and operation, and they didn't, then that's, uh, that's not okay. We have some questions or contributions, let's see. Um, Someone's telling us that the Henry Hobson Richardson house built on 16th street um, became car part of a condo building. Yes, that is now that my memory is shaken. I remember that. Um, still, looks like it, it always looked like it was kind of burnt on the outside. Like yeah. they most of it off when they redeveloped it, but it must have suffered <laughs> fire at some point because it looks kind of charcoal-y. So back to our Hyrick house. Um, the Heyrich family replaced the glass roof in their conservatory room with, oh, I said it wrong. The Heyrich family replaced the glass roof in their home's conservatory room with tile after the Knickerbocker disaster, perhaps for fear that it was going to collapse. And um, she, this person used to be a docent at the Heyrich house. So out of, out of abundance of caution, because they didn't want the same fate to befall that room in their home, which also had a glass roof at the time. So good thing I went back and looked because that was completely different than what I shared. Um, yeah, and it's it's like you know if you if you uh, you know you read about the Titanic and how they cut corners making the Titanic and the bulkheads uh, between the anti-flood chambers in the hall if they had just built them a bit taller they would have survived that day and it's similar with the uh um the investigation into the knickerbocker found that they used like the bolts they used to put the girders together or something if they had used slightly longer bolts or slightly stronger bolts it would have been fine but 
they cut that corner to save a few bucks and wow. you know and on, on 9 11 i remember i was in the midst of doing a lot of this history stuff and i was thinking like praying that that would stay the single biggest loss of life in dc history was the knickerbocker collapse yeah. some people say it was uh, fort stevens during uh, the civil war um, but, uh, yeah, I was in the midst of studying Knickerbocker history and I'm like, let's hope that those 98 people who didn't have to die, let's hope that we don't have right. more dying in a single place on a single day. Right, right. Someone wonders, um, they saw a 19th century map that showed Calvert Street, which is, runs from Woodley Park into Adams Morgan neighborhood was listed as Cincinnati Street. Do you know anything about that? Is there maybe connection to the Society of the Cincinnati down uh, Massachusetts Avenue? Possible. It's also, at some point, I've seen some maps that listed Biltmore as Baltimore. Um, and I don't know if that was another case of, like we said, with the Great Lakes sub-neighborhood of Adams Morgan, uh, Great Lake named streets sub neighborhood or like the university streets section of Columbia Heights. I don't know if that was an early plan to name the streets after cities, after American cities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I have definitely seen it, but I don't remember ever reading an explanation uh, why Cincinnati. I mean, it could just be the developers from Cincinnati. The, this stuff was not always uh, noble or, or uh, right. yeah. deeply right. thought out. Right. Someone wonders, because you work for the DC government and in your capacity, you're working for the DC council, um, the, you then, but despite the fact that you're part of the DC government, you were able to testify before or against the, um, this development, the Lion Hotel. That predates, predates my time with the council. My time ah, with, okay. I've been with the council for six years and uh, this is back when I was an ANC commissioner and was working for the Business Improvement District. Very good. I'm going to stop sharing this part of my screen and I want to put up one last thing for folks to see, except now I can't find it. I want people to get your book, Adams Morgan, a part of the Then and Now series, um, and it could be gotten online really easily. I got my copy in a bookstore when there were still abundant bookstores in DC, but go to your folks, go to your <clears throat> website and pull up Politics and Prose or East City Books or Kramers and order it from um, any of them in COVID time, but they will have it on the shelves if you go there in person. Yeah, in, in Adams Morgan, they have it at uh, Lost City, mm -hmm. uh, books, mm -hmm. which is what uh, the new name for Idle Time Books and at uh, Potter's House. Oh, at Potter's so, House, excellent. As, uh, as businesses are reopening, um, those are two local businesses you can support. And the other, thing, oh, um, the, the other thing I would just say is, uh, as folks are going out on their uh, essential exercise walks, um, I also worked uh, on the Heritage Trail, the Adams Morgan Heritage Trail. Yeah. Um, and that is great because it's totally self-guided. Uh, it, would take you, if you went to all of the signs, would take you two, three hours probably. It takes you all through the neighborhood. Uh, and it's a great uh, sort of interactive opportunity. There's material on the signs. There's a guidebook right. that you can get at uh, online. Um, but there's yeah, culturaltourismdc.org. Yeah. And the yeah. trail is Roads to Diversity. Right. Yeah, it's excellent. And you know what? It has the benefit, if you want a little cardio, there is an uphill component to that particular heritage trail because you're walking up 16th Street alongside Meridian Hill Park at one point. So you get a little cardio if you want it. Right. Josh, well, thank you so I much. The streetcar was to, to get people up that hill, but now, right. uh, now you gotta just hoof it. You gotta just hoof it. Or I guess get a scooter, but now we'll hoof it. Josh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your loyalty um, to your neighborhood in your DC hometown was really wonderful. 
And I hope this will inspire people to, if you haven't been to Adams Morgan for a while, high time you went back and checked it out. And uh, absolutely, and to the folks who mentioned that, uh, that I have a government job, uh, rest assured that I'll be taking leave time for the couple hours that I'm doing this tour. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, good, good. So yeah, and you know, you can follow the council on Twitter and you're gonna be getting um, the voice of our guest today in large part, which is a really good voice to hear on Twitter. All right, thanks again, Josh, and thanks everyone else for joining us. Let me just quickly show you that next Wednesday, same time, we are gonna be joined by three um, artists, playwrights, writers, who have spent a lot of time writing about and being inspired by this woman here, Clover Adams, wife of Henry Adams, writer, also historian, but this is someone that we all need to know more about. She's probably best known as the inspiration for and the reason for the um, Adams Memorial in Rock Creek Cemetery, one of the most renowned pieces of memorial sculpture in the United States. But there's much more to Clover Adams than her death by suicide. Um, and we're gonna talk about that next week with two playwrights, who wrote a play about her, and also Natalie Dykstra, who is the author of the biography of Clover Adams. So join us next week for that. We will look forward to seeing you. And Josh, thanks again very Thank much. You. Thanks for watching, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.